Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to Florida Friendly Landscaping for the part-time resident. This is kind of a new and different um, session today because we're focusing specifically on the people who are own here for, you know, six months or so a year. And a lot of things are going to be different for you. A lot of things will be the same if you watch my classes. There's still a lot you can gather from that. So don't just miss those. There's still a lot you can learn. But today we're going to focus on things specifically for people who are not here all year long because, you know, there's that's a kind of a different lifestyle. Joining me today is my co-host Karen. She is from Mosquito Control, Karen Mojica. And she's going to have a little portion um, in the show to talk to you about mosquito control and the part-time resident and some things you might not have thought about so that you're not attracting mosquitoes while you're gone and that might be causing problems for your neighbors. All right. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities uh, with water conservation and the program that I utilize is Florida Friendly Landscaping to teach people water conservation um, in their landscapes. There is my email, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. You'll see it several times throughout the presentation. If you would like a PDF copy emailed to you of this program, because there's gonna be a lot of information on it. So if you wanna go back and be able to read it, uh, don't put it in the chat because I might not see the chat again. So email me. That's the best way to reach me. And I'll be glad to send you a PDF copy of this. So what exactly is Florida Friendly Landscaping? Well, here are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. It was basically developed by the University of Florida in the mid to late 90s, kind of Florida's answer to xeriscaping but it also addresses very Florida specific things. Down here is just a very, very uh, simple way of saying what Florida friendly landscaping is. Kind of reminds me of when my grandson, I guess he was about 11, he asked me what I do. And <laughs> I went into this big long explanation and he said, okay, you teach people how to go green in their yards. Well, there you go, nice and succinct there. So, but Florida friendly landscaping means using low maintenance plants. Who likes the idea of low maintenance? I know I do. Um, and environmentally sustainable practices. So good for you, good for the environment. And it certainly can be worked into a um, yard that you're not there all the time to watch over. Here's um, some resources where you can learn more about Florida friendly landscaping and I'm going to cover this again. Um, see some of my little screens and boxes are covering up my <laughs> actual slides so I have to move them around. The first is the website just to learn about Florida friendly landscaping. The other one watermatters.org. Um, all of these are resources where you can get a hold of one of these books. And I have one here, Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. This is a wonderful place to start. And here's how you can get your hands, like I do, on one of these books. That website at the top, um, from there, that's the University of Florida website, from there, you can download it and have a PDF of it. But I know a lot of people like to have it in their hands to take to the nurseries or wherever. And you can request a free copy from watermatters.org. That is the Southwest Florida Water Management District's website. So if you are in one of the Southwest Florida Water Management Districts, um, they don't like me to use their acronym as much, so I'm avoiding it. <laughs> it's not the official name. Um, if you are in one of their 16 counties, which is part of their district, um, go to that, go under resources for homeowners. You'll see all kinds of cool things. But down on page two, you can request 
one of these and they'll mail it to you. And I know it works because I did it and they mailed it to my house. Um, if you're in the St. John's Water Management District or maybe whatever other ones, South Florida Water Management District, um, give them a call or go online and see if they offer that for you as well. If you're here in Hernando County, you can call the County Extension Office at that phone number there, 352-754-4433 and arrange to go pick up one of these books. They will even bring it out to you if you don't wanna come in the building or the Master Gardeners here in Hernando County at that address, 19490 Oliver Street here in Brooksville. They have these books. They'll be glad to hand you a copy for free and they're open Wednesdays and Saturdays between nine and 11. So obviously you're not gonna make it there today because Karen and I are so riveting to listen to, um, but you can go Saturday perhaps next Wednesday and pick one up. But you need to be careful though, because just because this book exists doesn't mean anything in it is gonna work for you. You gotta make sure you're getting for zone 9A if you're in Central Florida. And also you're gonna have very specific needs. Everyone has to pay attention to their site conditions. You're gonna have to pay attention to not only your site conditions, you know, right plant, right place is our first order, but also growth habits and, um, you know, how they behave during the season that you're here. But we're going to cover a lot of that. The first question you need to ask yourself is what kind of gardener am I? What kind of gardener are you? Are you not really that much of a gardener? Not, I mean, you enjoy gardens. But you don't really want to be out there that much messing with it. You just want it to look nice. Are there, is there something you'd rather be doing than uh, messing around out in your yard? You'd rather be uh, snorkeling or something a lot more fun? Well, that's fine too. You know that there's no problem with that. But we would can um, suggest that you do is, you know, downsize the yard that you have so you don't have as much to work with. If that's not really an option, you can create more hardscape. What is hardscape? Hardscape is anything in your yard that's not a plant or not, you know, it can be a deck, a patio, uh, a bench, <laughs> um, any kind of retaining walls, uh, your paths, your mulch, all of that is considered hardscape. And that can be made to look very, very attractive, and then just have less plant material around it. Um, if you want to play a little bit with plants, but not, you know, have that consume a good part of your days, you might want to consider just having a small area where you have cool season annuals. And we're going to address that as well. A great way to do that is um, to put it in containers and do a lot of container gardening. And we'll, we'll discuss that as well. And anytime you reduce that lawn area, you're going to be saving a lot of water and a lot of work for yourself. So if you create more beds, more hardscape, um, things like that, and less lawn, you're gonna have less work for you to do and less to worry about while you're gone. Uh, let's see. If you are one who likes to get your hands dirty, that's the kind of gardener you are. You really like to get in there. It's your hobby. You want to do it. You have to get your hands in that dirt and have some fun. Karen, this is my sage. That's one of my, that's my youngest granddaughter. Ah. I just took this picture um, a couple weeks ago in Virginia. But if you are, um, one who just wants to get in there and really have a lot of fun. So then you got to think about, well, how much work do I really want to do? I love to garden, but that doesn't mean I want to do it all the time. You know, I'm a little bit of a lazy <laughs> gardener. I like a yard that kind of does its own thing. Another thing is how much money do you want to spend? And that's a big consideration. I can't even imagine you guys who have <laughs> more than one home. 
and you know all that entails with that. I have listened to a similar class uh, about snowbird gardening um, from Indian River County Extension. So a lot of my ideas are coming from them. Um, but one of them, when I listened to it, they were saying they knew someone who came down. Indian River County Extension is in Vero Beach um, on the East Coast. They had someone they talked to who would come down and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars every time they came down, like up into thousands of dollars to get their landscape back the way they wanted. <clears throat> I don't think there is any reason to have to spend that kind of money once you really get things established, if you, you know, do it the right way. Another thing you have to consider is who's taking care of things while you're away. Do you have someone, um, is a neighbor looking after things? I used to know, um, was a master gardener who was a part-time resident, but they would come down for a week in the middle of every July just to clean up their yard again while they were away. And to me, you know, it seems more efficient to me to have a yard that's not going to be a jungle or get out of control and, you know, pay someone who's going to keep an eye on it. Here's another thing I stole from Indian River <laughs> and, and uh, Jamie Buffett as well. But just remember, you know, while you're here, you're in Florida. So we should have changes in latitude should equal changes in attitude, changes in your plant attitude. You don't want to bring down the plants from up home, wherever up home is, um, whether that's New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. Um, First of all, it's probably not a great idea. Like there are a lot of invasive pests that if you're moving plants around, you could possibly be bringing like the, uh, what is that? The, some kind of lantern fly, red spotted lantern fly that is all over um, Eastern Pennsylvania. You know, you don't want to start bringing plants that could spread those kind of things around. The other thing is they just very possibly are not going to work here. These picture, two pictures are showing you, you know, you're not going to have your tulips. I'm sorry. Um, if you go back soon enough, maybe plant them before you leave up north and get back soon enough to enjoy them there. That's fine, but you're not going to have them here. We don't do that many bulbs. We do amaryllis. That's at the bottom. You can enjoy your amaryllis here. You can enjoy daylilies, but don't try and force tulips, uh, daffodils, uh, peonies, all these <laughs> wonderful things. Enjoy those in your home up north and enjoy your Florida plants here. But remember, that being said, here in Central Florida and Hernando County, we're not tropical. We're what they call subtropical. You know, it's not that unheard of to get to 17 degrees. You know, it's been a while, hasn't it, Karen? <laughs> But it used to happen fairly regularly. Um, a freeze is going to happen. I can almost guarantee you that. At least one to four freezes will happen. And some of your plants are going to um, get bit back, but will come back. But when will they come back? You know, not when you can enjoy them. So you got to, you know, think about that type of thing as well. So what you do is when you come down, um, you want to start right away on your yard because, you know, you only have a limited amount of time. And I know you have a lot to do when you get here. But if you want to have that nice yard, you got to start, you know, within a week or so of when you get here. Look around. What is already there? Especially if you're new and you didn't put it there. What is there? Say, I have no idea. I don't know. Well, we can help you. You can... Um, Email me, there's my email again, and email me a picture. Or you can stop by the county extension office and say, what is this? I don't, <laughs> I don't know what this is. And we can help you identify it and tell you if it's a good plant or a bad plant. There's no such thing as bad plants, but there are invasive exotic plants that might not be the best well, for anybody, but especially you who is going to get out of control while you're gone. 
I know a lot of people, um, what you used to do when you didn't leave in the winter was pour through those catalog books and those seed books. Don't buy things that, you know, from seed catalogs based up north. Order books, uh, you know, that sell you things for your region. Um, FloridaWildflowers.org is a website you can go to to get different wildflowers that will grow here. And again, remember, we are zone 9A. So you're not going to force those zone 5 plants to do very well here at all. Nor are you going to force the 10B, you know, that might grow great in Miami probably grow great here too, until we have a freeze or even a frost. What's happening while you're away? Karen and I are sitting here working and sweating to death while, while you went up north <laughs> for six months. And our roads are a lot more open, <laughs> but we do miss you while you're away. And I hope you know, more were able to come back even despite COVID. Um, but what's happening during that time? Well, obviously, you know, it's very hot and humid in the summer. That's kind of one of those duh statements, but that's why you're not here <laughs> because you're smarter than we are. But, <laughs> um, and I know it can be just as hot up north too, but not for as long of a time. I'm just reminding you that your plants that are left here are dealing with that heat and that humidity. So that's a consideration of what you put in your yard and where. I'm kind of going through this backwards. It rains a lot in the summer. It's another one of those duh statements, but that could also mean if it's raining every day and your sprinkler system is on um, once a week, that your lawn may be getting overwatered, which is going to lead to a decline in your lawn, possibly take all root rot, uh, gray leaf spot, Karen knows about that one, don't you? Or other issues. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how you can kind of deal with that irrigation system as well. Here's something you might not have ever really thought about. You know, you're here during the winter and it's pretty, I mean, past, I just got back from Pennsylvania myself. I spent about two weeks up there. Um, kind of a interesting thing, just as I got settled on the airplane, I mean, the second I got settled on the airplane, I did a double take out the window. As I was getting ready to take off, it started snowing. <laughs> well, time to go. <laughs> um, but when you leave Florida and summer comes, the sun is higher in the summer than in the winter. So some areas that you're used to being partly shady or so in your yard, maybe full sun while you're gone. Just, you know, think about that with the type of plants that you put in those areas. I think containers, um, I think part-time residents that containers are a great way to go for you because it's a lot more mobile, you know, and easier to deal with. And also maybe you can have some of those tropicals, but then bring them in the garage when we're going to have a frost or a freeze. Just a lot easier to deal with. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with containers. When I say they're gold, good for cold sensitive plants, it's because you can bring them in. It's not as good for cold sensitive plants if you're leaving them out because obviously their roots are not in the ground and protected. It's, you know, their roots could freeze in that pot. If the roots are in the ground, we don't have permafrost. Our ground never freezes. It's gonna stay about 48 degrees, you know, so your roots are safer in the ground than out in that pot. So, you know, if you do have a potted plant, smashing them all together like this is, is not a bad idea, you know, if it's going to get um, cooled out. Um, but, you know, bringing them in is probably your best, the best thing you want to do. I'm going to talk about uh, cold protection in a little bit. What is this first one, this pot in pot method? It has nothing to do with, you know, something that's legal in 20 states now for medical purposes. Um, 
it's actually what they do, uh, like in Epcot and Disney and all those places. I always ask everyone, have you ever seen a bad looking flower at Disney or in Epcot? No, you have not. And the reason for that is because they have fairies there that snatch up the bad looking flowers as soon as they start looking bad. But how do they do that? Because they have pots submerged into the ground and they put those annuals in a pot that's just a little bit smaller in that submerged pot in the ground, cover it up with mulch. Easy, in and out. That might be something you want to consider for your small area of annuals that you want to play with as well. It will need a little bit more water because they are in pots, but it will be a lot easier of a switch out for you. Just something to think about. Don't do that over large, massive areas, but a small area where you want to play with annuals might make it nice and easy for you. Or even like that big pot in the back in this picture, you know, put smaller pots within that big pot and then switch those out as well. Here are some of the cool season annuals. This isn't all of them, but this is some of them that if you want to make sure you have color in your yard while you're here, because you miss actually the most beautiful <laughs> time as far as plants go when everything is green and luscious and all these flowers are blooming. You know, we're called Florida for a reason, but we do have a winter, especially here in central Florida. So things are muted, but that's when the weather is more enjoyable. So obviously that's when you're here. I just keep saying that because I'm jealous of you. You know, so, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm gonna get to that point one day. I think where I can come and go like that. Um, here are some cool season annuals that'll bring some color to your yard. Your pansies and your petunias, where you might think early spring, early summer up north. Nope, they're winter here, and I've never seen any type of cold snap bother them. The heat will bother them. They'll be leggy and gone and dead by May but they'll love the cold. Pansies, petunias, snapdragons, that should be calendula, foxgloves, alyssum, carnations, dianthus, and even your johnny jump ups, your viola. They'd be great annuals to have around. Perennials, there's a whole lot more than this, <laughs> but I'm just giving you ones that actually um, will keep blooming through the winter. Their bloom time is through the winter. Poinsettias, poinsettias, there you go. And um, I have classes on holiday plants. You can learn more about how to do that. Flax lily, marble leaf, Persian shield. Now they don't necessarily have flowers, but they bring a lot of beautiful color to your yard. The Philippine violet is the one at the top right. Great replacement for that Mexican petunia, which is an invasive exotic. And I used to have one of these Philippine violets in another house and the Cardinals just absolutely loved it. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, narrow leaf sunflower. That's a native. I just planted some a little, about a month before I went on vacation and I came back and found some blooming. So that was a nice, nice surprise there. Lion's ear, climbing aster is going to be blooming probably end of winter, very early spring, and it can be just blooming like crazy for you. And of course, you know, you in the, as far as shrubs, you have your azaleas and your camellias, things like that, that'll bring you nice color as well. In your yard, though, I want you to think small. And by that, I mean, get dwarf varieties or slow growers. So that reduces the amount of pruning and maintenance you have to do on it. It just makes a lot more sense to have like the dwarf yopon hollies, which are over on the left in the garage there, by the garage. I have some that are about 12 years old. They're now up to my hips. And I have maybe slightly pruned them about three times and they stay in those nice little round meatball shapes. So, you know, it's, it's a great idea to 
lessen your workload by getting things that are slow to grow and are dwarf varieties that are going to stay small for you. But keep in mind um, a perennial landscape. You want, as we mentioned, bring in that color by have a, a small area for annuals. That really should be the only expense you have when you come down is if you wanna play with annuals and get new annuals. The only you know major thing. But when you have perennials, you know, get those ones that are gonna bloom in the cool season. We have lots of perennials that will bloom all year long until you get a frost or a freeze, um, you know, which that could be enjoyable for you too. But you wanna have something that you know is reliable to bloom and be pretty for the time frame that you're here. Um, and deciduous trees, here's a picture of a crepe myrtle. It's actually pruned correctly. <laughs> That's a good thing. Crepe myrtles are beautiful, aren't they? We love our crepe myrtles. They're not that beautiful when you're here, <laughs> when a part-time residents are here. I do think they have a lovely structure and a lot of winter interest, and I don't want you hat racking them and making them all gnarled up and ugly. But to me, you know, enjoying its winter interest should be something that you do when you can also enjoy the other eight months a year when it's giving you beautiful flowers. For a uh, part-time resident, you're just gonna have this stick looking thing in your yard and never see it when it's gorgeous and beautiful and flowering. So in that and any other kind of deciduous trees or shrubs that lose everything in the winter, I would not make room for them in my part-time yard if it were me. I would have more things that I can enjoy when I'm here. And speaking of pruning, um, you don't wanna remove more than a third of an established plant. You'll be tempted before you leave to like hack everything down to <laughs> almost nothing. But if you stay with those slow growers and the dwarf varieties, you know, you can really reduce your pruning. But it, for the health of the plant, you never wanna remove more than a third of it at a time. So what you can do is when you get here, if there's pruning that needs done, do it right away. And then do it again, removing that third right before you leave. That might be a good plan. But also keep frosts in mind. If you're pruning, pruning encourages new growth. New growth is very susceptible to frost and freeze damage, and it can take it back to the rest of the plant. You want, really want to avoid any kind of pruning after October 15th until March 15th again. So, you know, if you come before that, which many of you don't, but, you know, staying a little bit longer, that would be the time to prune. And that in between time, that winter time is not really great for pruning, unless it is a deciduous plant, which we just, just discussed, like kind of what's the point of a deciduous plant for a part-time uh, resident. It's always about the right plant in the right place. Consider the mature size. If you go with dwarf varieties, you don't have to worry so much about it's going to outgrow its space or it's going to cover up my window or it's going you know, hide the cameras or something. Just think about right plant, right place. And let's talk about trees. Again, avoid deciduous trees. I love deciduous trees. I don't have anything against them. I think they're, you know, a lot of them are great wildlife attractors, but for your situation and your limited selection for your yard, I would go with something that is evergreen and that you can enjoy. Also, messy trees, you know, that flower while you're away. First of all, you're not going to be enjoying the flowering, but also it's just going to create messes while you're away more for you to clean up or more for you to pay someone to have to clean up. Weak or old trees, just not that great of an idea to have around when you're not at your yard all the time. We are, we're, you know, there's a storm out there brewing right now. Um, December 1st is supposed to be the end of hurricane season, but the past several years, the hurricane stopped reading when the end of the season was supposed to be. 
Um, it'll happen whenever it happens. And weaken old trees, um, just not a great idea. They could just create more messes in your yard by slowly falling apart, or they could, you know, fall on something. Um, when you do decide, I want a new tree, you want to plant it as soon as you get here so you have time to help it establish. But also, small young trees, and we all want that instant gratification. But here's the thing, especially in your situation, small young trees establish faster. So you can feel better if you um, go ahead and want to plant a new tree, do it within the first week or two that you come down. So you have time to water it in and get it established and it should be fairly on its way being established by the time you leave. That's not gonna happen if you buy this adult tree that you know might take years to establish. And I would hire an arborist uh, to come around and check out your trees, especially look at those old and weak trees. Um, it's going to be a lot cheaper for you in the long run to get their opinion and have them take care of things and um, much better than, you know, relying on Joe who knocks on your door and says, I'm going to prune up your trees for you. <laughs> you know, get an arborist. You can find one at treesarecool.com. Treesarecool that is actually uh, the website of the International Society of Arboriculture. And they have a search on there. You can put in your area and find the arborists in your area. So I would highly recommend um, doing that. Having someone who comes, checks out your trees probably every year. And speaking of trees, uh, palms. I know you all wanna be here for the palms. That's what you wanna be in Florida to have these palms. Remember here in Hernando, we are in zone 9A. So a lot of palms are for more tropical of areas. We do have palms we can grow here. I, you know, dread the day when we do have some real freezes again, like where it's 28 degrees for four hours or more, because we're gonna have a lot of dead queen palms around here. They're just not really for this area. Um, but there are lots of other palms you can have. Um, just remember hurricane pruning is not a thing. <laughs> Again, Joe's gonna knock on your door and be like, hey, I wanna hurricane prune your, your palms so you're safe. That's not really a thing. Just think about all the palms that lived through all the hurricanes before we ever came around. Uh, a palm tree is actually not a tree, it's a grass. <laughs> it's just a very big piece of grass, but that spear leaf that's its growing point. And if that becomes damaged, the palm is dead, that's it. So this little diagram shows you how you should prune if you're gonna prune. If you wanna remove that skirt, you can, you don't have to, but in your situation, if you're worried about it being messy around your yard while you're gone, those brown uh, fronds, you can do that. But I always show people, um, you know, just kind of do this and this, is where you wanna keep all your leaves, nine o'clock and three o'clock, and you can prune anything under it. Don't do the leaving those tiny little things. That's very bad for the palm. Also, just a little note, palms don't do well with a lot of nitrogen. They hate, they hate too much nitrogen. So if you're just assuming it's gonna be fertilized the way you fertilize your lawn, that's not gonna work out for the palm tree. Um, it actually, you know, you're better off getting what they call a palm special. Epsom salt won't hurt it, but that's only giving it one thing it needs, which is magnesium. It also needs manganese, uh, potassium, I think. And, you know, you're better off getting a palm special and not hurting the palm by um, putting too much nitrogen on its roots. Now, caring for those beds. Mulch is the number one thing, <coughs> of course, in a, in a bed, aside from the plants themselves. You wanna get a long lasting, but natural mulch. I know the temptation because you're not around is to get 
rubber or rock. Uh, that's not a Florida friendly practice. We don't recommend it. Part of the idea of mulch is to add something back to our sandy soil to improve its um, nutrient holding capacity. So rubber and rock aren't going to do that. Rock's not going to add anything harmful. But remember I told you about how hot it is here in the summer? You might be baking your plants by having them surrounded by rock while you're gone in the summer. And mulch, I mean, there's heavy metals, there's petroleum, I mean, I'm sorry, rubber mulch. So that's not something we want leaching into our soil. And also it attracts a lot of heat as well. Why do I have on here avoid cypress mulch? It won't hurt your yard at all. It's just an ethical, um, non-sustainable non practice. It's an ethical issue that Florida Friendly Landscaping doesn't recommend the use of cypress mulch because the way it is being obtained is they go into the wetlands, shred down very young trees to immediately sell to us as mulch. And that's not a practice we want to encourage. When I say avoid mulch that could bring in weeds, that means like you see the uh, tree cutters or you know somebody like that shredding down and you think, great, 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 this is a, I have access to some free mulch if I just ask them to uh, dump it there, which I'm not saying not to do that, but if you do that, let it sit a while. You don't wanna use it this season. <laughs> you wanna wait till you come back the next season because it's still too green. And as it's breaking down, it's putting off a lot of heat. I killed an, a whole bed that way. So, but the other thing, especially you as the part-time resident, getting that kind of mulch from kind of unknown sources, their job is to cut the trees away from the power line or to cut the trees away from, you know, your view of the road. It's all they care. That's all they have to do. That's their job is our safety. So mixtures of trees could be invasive exotics. There could be invasive vines mixed up in there. And the last thing you want to do as a part-time resident is bring in weeds that cause more work and more trouble for you. And with beds, um, you know, it's fun sometimes to have like all kinds of different shapes and beds and things, but make it easier on yourself by having simple lines or easier on yourself so that you don't have to worry about whoever you have hired to mow while you're gone, you know, mowing down <laughs> into your flower bed. Nice, simple, not too sharp, not like squares or anything, but you know, nice, simple curved lines make things a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> and again, get Florida plants <laughs> for your Florida yard. That's the easiest way to put that. And um, vines and other ground covers, even if they're native in your situation, might not be the best thing to think about because there are some that are very aggressive growers. That's what you want to avoid in your part-time landscape. You want it to grow nice, you don't want it to die, but you don't want a jungle because you're not there all the time to keep it in check. So, you know, things that are known to be really aggressive vines or aggressive ground covers, you might want to avoid those as well. And I mentioned that Florida Friendly Landscaping was kind of Florida's answer to xeriscaping, but here's a little xeriscaping 101. While you're placing plants around your yard, keep things with like water needs together. You don't want to plant you know, aloe and impatience in the same bed because one of them's not going to be happy. Just think of those things as well. Here's another thing that's sort of <laughs> because, you know, it does involve plants, but I thought I would throw this in there since you're a part-time resident. You don't want to provide hiding places for unwelcomed guests by your plants, you know, Get those dwarf shrubs or make sure that they're trimmed. Um, when you are there, you can use some creative kind of temporary screening of your neighbors or something. 
that you take down while you're gone. Um, be careful with this, but if you want to really, uh, you know, discourage anyone from, from trying to get in through the back or something, might want to use some thorny bushes back there, but be careful when you or your maintenance person is caring for those. Make sure you're, if you have a ring doorbell or some kind of camera system, it's not going to do you much good if you have a tree or a large shrub that's blocking the view. Keep that, you know, uh, keep those trimmed down. Put up some motion detector lights. Make sure plants aren't <laughs> hiding the motion detectors. And aside from human critters that you want to keep away, there are <laughs> animal critters that you want to keep away while you're gone. You want to really make sure that none of the trees or shrubs or bushes allow something to climb up and get on your roof. Um, because there's been, you know, multiple occasions where somebody had raccoons living in their roof or rats, even worse. Um, so you want to not provide the pathway for them. And we love fruit trees. We want to be here and have our citrus and everything. But just remember while you're gone, if the fruit is falling on the ground and you're not there to pick it up all the time, someone's going to find it and that someone might be some kind of vermin. So keep that in mind as well. And here I'm going to let Karen talk for a little bit about mosquitoes and the part-time resident. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Lily. Um, my name is Karen. I work here at Hernando County Mosquito Control and we are full-time here uh, all year round. But I must say that summers are our busy season. Um, the majority of which comes from the increase in rain. And with the increase in rain comes increased pockets of water where our mosquitoes can breed. Um, and then they breed and it becomes, um, out, you know, can become out of control. So what we always suggest to the residents that are here during that time is to dump and drain any standing water um, a couple times a week, uh, bases of flower pots, if you have any buckets, uh, any kind of watering cans, things like that. If they sit out there long enough, that larvae will hatch and they will, um, they, they produce quite a bit. So with not being here during those summer months, my best suggestion is to not leave anything outdoors that can attract that water. So if you have a bird bath, um, maybe bring it in inside while you're gone or flip it over so that it won't hold that water because bird baths are a big breeding spot. Um, if you are here and during when you're using it, we always suggest that you hose it out um, at least once a week, use a brush. The eggs will sit on the edge of the water there. Um, so you do need to kind of brush it. If you don't like doing that, then probably best not even to have a bird bath. They are kind of a lot of work, um, but they're beautiful. So if you do have it and you're leaving, maybe put that away as well as any empty flower pots or bases of flower pots your best bet is to keep that flower pot where the drain at the bottom will allow it to just drain and not sit as a water collector. Um, the other thing, I brought my little visual here. Uh, we have these beautiful plants. Mine is not flowering at the moment. Um, it is just green, but those are bromeliads and they are uh, very popular here in our area. And unfortunately, they are also huge mosquito breeding spots. I'm gonna show you one more thing. I don't know if the camera will get it just right, but there is a pocket right here in the center and it holds quite a bit of water. I would say sometimes I can get like a good eight ounce glass of water out of that if I tip it. So that is a really great spot for mosquitoes to go. They go into the center, they lay their eggs there and because it holds so much water, um, it's almost like a cup in there in the center. So we always recommend if you have them to either flush them out with a hose at least once a week. There are granules that you can use to sprinkle in them, but they only last about 30 days. So if you're gone for the entire summer, 
it's not going to help. My recommendation personally from being here and seeing how many people have mosquito problems from these plants is maybe to either give them to someone who is here year round who can maintain them um, or replace them with uh, something that's not so much of a mosquito breeder. You're not here to, to feel those um, mosquitoes while you're gone, but your neighbors that are, um, they call in and, and sometimes we go out there and we see that, you know, that is um, a culprit. And new residents have that as well. Um, they don't realize that those are such big pockets to breed those mosquitoes. Um, like I said, we are here all year round. So we have technicians that go out. If you do come back and you find that you're having a lot of mosquitoes when you get here, um, you don't see anything that could be causing it, give us a call. That's what we're here for. There is no charge. Our guys will go out, they'll do an inspection. It could be a tire, uh, couldn't, may not even be on your property. Um, it could be a neighboring property, a vacant piece of property, could have a bucket that was dumped there, a tire that was left in the woods. Um, it could be a tree hole, which, um, you know, that's a natural, a nature spot. Um, but those things can hold enough water to create quite a population of mosquitoes. So our guys will come out, they'll do a walk around, they'll check and see where that uh, source is. Um, Although we do send the truck out at night sometimes, um, we only do that as our final resort to knock down the mosquitoes that have already hatched. If you have um, a breeding spot, it could even be a drain. It could be um, you know, drainage retention areas. Uh, your sewer drains could be holding some water inside. And our guys are trained to come out there and, and do treatments on those things. So. Um, to make your life healthy and safe, give us a call. Our guys will come out. They'll locate that water source. They'll treat the water source. And then if need be for a truck or a spray, uh, they will do that as well. But if they're just going to keep hatching day after day, a truck or a spray treatment really isn't helping solve the problem. It's only eliminating the ones that have already hatched. Um, our guys are great. They're friendly. They're knowledgeable. Um, and like I said, there is no charge. This is a service of Fernando County. Uh, we do this because mosquitoes are disease carriers. Um, so it's for the health of you and your neighbors. Um, there was something else I was gonna go with that and I just kind of lost my train <laughs> of thought. Um, oh, we do not come out for other things. We don't come out for noceums, um, palmetto bugs things like that, those are not part of our services. Our service is only for mosquitoes because they are the ones that um, carry the diseases that we need to maintain. Um, we have things that we use year round as well to help us monitor and uh, keep track. So while you're not here, uh, we do have uh, traps in certain areas that we monitor to see that our populations of mosquitoes are low, but feel free to give us a call. Our number here is 352-540-6552. And like I said, I'll be here. Um, I'll answer that call. You can even go on our website or our Facebook page. You could put in your own service request if you'd like. And our guys are very quick. We are online access. So sometimes people call in the morning. We're there within an hour or two. Um, it's not, a, a, if it's a busy day and they're not in your area, it could be next day, but they are really quick to respond. And we are here to service our, serve our Fernando County residents. Okay, well, thank you, Karen. And You're I welcome. Learned, I just learned something else about bromeliads and this will show you how much they attract mosquitoes. Because I did a class on um, spooky gardens for Halloween and uh -huh. There is, you know, debate amongst the plant community whether or not they consider bromeliads carnivorous plants. And, you know, the purists say they're not because they don't emit that um, pheromone, which attracts insects to them. But a lot of people put them in the carnivorous plant category because they, their water does attract so many mosquitoes and they do use 
the mosquito bodies for protein in their plants. So good to know. Yeah, yeah. So that is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great bromeliads out there, but it's probably not a good idea for someone who's not going to be able to watch them. Um, lawn care here, this is a subject all in itself. So you'll have to forgive me, you know, if I kind of go through it quickly. And you can look through a lot of my other classes, find out about lawn care. The best thing that you can do, if there's an area that just does not grow well, stop fighting it. <laughs> um, one of my classes is called uh, When Lawns Just Don't Cut It. You might want to look back in the events on Facebook. I believe it might be on the YouTube channel by now, and I'll give you that information <coughs> about alternatives to lawns. Like this these side area between houses is always a bad area you know, well then create something else other than a lawn. But here's what I want you to be, if you left with nothing else, <laughs> if you have a lawn, you must have it mowed at four inches or higher. If you're getting it mowed lower, if you are mowing it lower, you are inviting the problems to your lawn. It is really the number one thing that invites, that and overwatering together invites issues that are bad for your lawn, especially, um, well, the two types of lawns that we have here are mainly St. Augustine or Floritam. Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine or Bahia. They both need to be mowed really high. How much water does it need? The question I get all the time, how long should I put on each zone? And I can't answer that. Too many variables. What I can tell you is how much water to deliver. Half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. You're gonna ask me, how do I know that? <laughs> Karen knows the answer to this, she hears it enough. Get yourself some tuna cans, catfish, catfish cans, well, cat food cans. <laughs> Mark in there, half inch or three quarters of an inch with your Sharpie. Get a bunch of those, put them randomly around your zone, turn that zone on, measure how much time it took to fill up to that mark. There you go. Say that, well, that was zone one and that took 25 minutes. And then you go in and you set zone one for 25 minutes. But you don't need to water just because it's your day to water. Speaking of which, <laughs> here are your days to water. In case you are unaware, we are on once a week watering restrictions. It's not going to change. That's year round all the time what it is. But here it, you're here in the winter and that's a good thing because our lawns are semi-dormant. They're not growing like crazy and you may wonder why because it's still usually pretty warm. Your lawns are responding to the amount of daylight hours. The uh, you know smaller less amount of daylight hours triggers the lawn to go into this semi-dormant stage sloughs off most of its root system so it can you can skip a week in the winter you can go 14 days if we have a rain you know then you're doing even better your lawn will tell you when it needs to be watered what it'll do is the blades will start folding like this in half, trying to shut out the sun and all, you know, trying to save water. And also when you walk across it, if your footprints remain there for a while, that's two ways that your lawn's saying, oh, getting a little, little parched, a little thirsty here. You don't have to panic and overreact and, but just wait till you're watering day and time and um, go ahead and water if it hasn't rained in between times. Um, our time just changed Sunday. Did you go out and change the time clock on your irrigation system? Ooh, we have a lot of wives looking at their husbands now, so you better <laughs> go on out to the garage and make sure that's in sync with the time. Um, and <coughs> your rain sensor. You should have a rain sensor if you have an irrigation system. And especially before you leave, make sure that that is working like it should. Make sure it is placed properly, not under your eave. 
not under a tree, not sideways, not upside down. I've seen all of these things um, and make sure that it's still working. You can do that by having someone hose it down like it's raining, you know, and then you know it got good and wet and you should not be able to your, your, turn your system on. Um, or go out when it is good and raining and make sure your system, you know, has not turned on. And if you have a wireless one, you want to check that battery, make sure that it's working. Probably the best thing, and this information comes from my colleague in Pasco County, Frank Galdo, who's the Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator uh, there. He gave me all this great information. Um, I, I think if I were a part-time resident, I would definitely invest in a, uh, you can get a soil moisture sensor or this ET controller, which is smart irrigation. It's in, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it senses how much moisture is on the leaves and in the soil as well. So location setup and calibration are key to achieving good performance. You wanna get it all set up well before you leave town so that any needed adjustments to um, calibration can be identified and corrected. What it is, it's, it's a Wi-Fi using smart system. And then you have an app on your phone that coordinates with it. So you can be sitting in your lounge chair in Maine and look and say, huh, look at how much it's raining in Spring Hill. I'm going to turn my irrigation system off. Or, you know, maybe your neighbor tells you this, this portion just doesn't look very good, but this does, you can control which zones come on. So if you are equipped with a flow sensor, you can even potentially detect unusual increases in flow rate that would indicate a possible leak. With me work, working um, in the water department, that's a huge um, benefit to have that you can be aware of a leak because of the increased flow going through your system before that gets to you in a bill. Karen used to work at the water department. We've both seen bills that we would cry if we got them. And we cry for you when you get them. <laughs> you, and so having this system, I think would be well worth the money. Obviously, you're going to have to leave your Wi-Fi on. You can't have that disconnected when you're gone. But I think more and more people are leaving it on anyway to have their cameras or their ring doorbell or something like that functional as well. So it's just something really to, to think about. And as Frank says here, flow sensors are getting cheaper each year. Leaks are not. <laughs> so... And speaking of leaks, here's an underground irrigation leak. It's not pretty, is it? Want to see something uglier than that? Here's the bill that came with somebody's irrigation leak. Yeah, Karen immediately um, scowled because she can read this bill, but I'm going to <laughs> explain it to you, to those who can't. Um, you see, uh, you know, they had, the way this works means that he used 9,200 gallons um, in December of 16. And so he owed us $20.29. That goes from there. Here he used 13,200 gallons and he owed us $29. In January of 2017, he used 218,000 gallons, 218,700,000 gallons. And he owed us $2,006.76 from a leak. Now, you can get an adjustment if that happens to you. And I don't know how all that works. Karen knows more than, than I do because she worked in customer service. But yeah, you um, call customer service if you get something like this. I know you get one a year. So if you got new sod and you used it on your new sod, you're not going to be able to use it on this leak. So my point, I guess, is if you suspect there's a problem, um, I mean, I've had phone calls from part-time residents that, you know, say I had this leak that I didn't know that I had, and now I owed all this money. And the way it works, you know, if it's not an underground leak, 
you don't qualify for the adjustment. Is that correct, Karen? Uh, and I yeah, had some, some poor soul who it was not an underground leak, but the pipes were under her mobile home. <laughs> and it, you know, so just have, if you, if you don't have that flow meter that you can, you know, be watching through an app on your phone, definitely have a person who goes and checks on those things for you to make sure everything is okay. Yeah. Fertilizing is not something you're going to really need to be doing while you're here with us. Um, it's not the right time of year and we do have an ordinance against it uh, for between January 1st and March 31st. You're not allowed, homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawn. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but we don't um, recommend the use of weed and feed products. You need to be trying to weed those pre-emergence um, mid-February, early February, which is not when you should be fertilizing. It's just not a good combo together. Also your semi-dormant lawn, remember? It's not doing anything, it doesn't need to be fertilized. Now don't think that we are New York or Pennsylvania and you need to go out there and sweeten the soil uh, every year. We don't need to do that here. We don't need to add lime. Our main uh, industry is that we provide phosphate. <laughs> we have phosphate mines here. It's in our ground. You don't need to do that. And you do need to follow the uh, fertilizer ordinance, which I will show you. <coughs> so between January 1st and March 31st, homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawns. You can fertilize your vegetable garden, uh, individual plants, but not your lawn. Um, and there's other rules that go with that as well. If you would like all the rules on it, you can email me and I will send it to you. I will also uh, let you know, this is the way it stands right now. There are talks going on that they want this changed a bit. But remember, it's government, so it's not happening tomorrow. <laughs> but let me tell you, when it changes, it's not getting less strict. <laughs> I think it's going to get more strict. I think um, I've done research. A lot of the counties also have a fertilizer ban uh, during the heavy rainy months of the summer. So I, you know, I foresee that really being these three months, but also June, July, August, that you can't fertilize. So, you know, you'll have very limited times that you can do that. Here's some cool season tips I warned you that could get pretty cool. And I don't think, you know, it doesn't make sense to me for you to come down to enjoy yourself. And all you're really doing is moving plants back and forth or panicking and covering up plants. <laughs> so. Ivy, I who live here all the time just said, you know, it's a tough love world out there, make it or don't. But, but if you want to cover your plants, um, fertilizing is going to encourage new growth, which is very susceptible to cold, so you don't really want to do that. Pruning is the same thing. Your sensitive plants, if you can't bring them in, um, what we do when we're going to have a freeze, we drive around and we see all these lollipops out there. Don't you see them, Karen? People think if they just wrap up their tree that that's going to protect it. <clears throat> we wrap up in a blanket because we generate heat as mammals. A tree doesn't. A tree does not generate any of its own heat. You are accomplishing nothing by um, making that lollipop there. What you were trying to do, remember I mentioned that ground is probably, you know, at the coldest, it's going to be 48. You're trying to capture that radiant heat from the ground. So you want to create a tent. Ideally, like this house is showing, a cardboard box, or they even do make these look like those little mini tents. Carmen, the recycling coordinator, gets a little aggravated that I show this picture that they use recycling bins, but it worked for the moment. <laughs> Ideally, the cover doesn't touch the plant at all, but that's not always possible. So you, want, you don't want to use plastic because that can transfer you know, more cold to the plant. You want to use a cloth. Um, if you have to cover the top and it's touching, it's, it's better you know, than not covering it at all. 
but make sure it's draped all the way to the ground so that you are capturing that radiant heat from the ground. Creating little lollipops does uh, nothing <laughs> for your plant. Also though, don't leave those on for days or weeks at a time. Photosynthesis, photosynthesis is a thing that plants need. So <laughs> remember to go out there and uncover them too. This is another thing uh, Frank thought of that, you know, he thought of, well, you really are a part-time property manager of your, of your property there. So as a property manager, um, you're a full-time property manager because you're trying to do it from afar as well. So it would probably be a good thing for you to look up this in this Florida friendly uh, landscaping webpage. We have a section for property managers. Even if you don't consider yourself a property manager, you are the manager of your property. And you're probably going to be hiring someone to take care of it when you're gone. So this model landscape contract and the uh, landscaping guide to hiring someone will really help you, um, you know, find the right person to take care of your yard when you're not there. We have upcoming classes. I said, we, we just really don't have time to touch everything <laughs> that you need to know. But these upcoming classes, um, especially Tuesday, November 24th, uh, creating a winter wildlife oasis in your central Florida yard. Um, I would like you to pay attention to that. I was speaking to some uh, part-time residents about a year ago who wanted some help with their yard. And I, they wanted to have a butterfly garden. And it is very, very unusual for me to tell someone don't have a butterfly garden, but I don't really want you attracting butterflies here in the winter <laughs> because um, they're gonna freeze. Maybe South Florida, maybe it's okay there, but not here. So enjoy your butterfly garden up North in the summer. But this will, um, birds, we certainly have birds that the snowbirds can enjoy the actual birds. And we're gonna cover a lot of that as well. And other pollinators and things. Um, check out my Facebook page. And also all of these classes will be put on Hernando County government's YouTube channel as well. Here I am again, here's my email and some great sources. If you don't, if you wanna know something about a plant you know, the internet's kind of a big scary thing where you can find all sorts of erroneous information. So you want to look um, at information that our land grant university puts out, which is the University of Florida. It's like Penn State or Cornell. Um, so it's where the College of Agriculture is. So you'll get researched based factual information with no one trying to sell you anything. So you can Google Azalea, and put UF after it. Or you can put this, which you may not remember, this IFAS, which is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. That's what we call our College of Agriculture because we're fancy. So um, UF or IFAS after that, and you'll just come up with tons and tons of information. If you also go to the Hernando County Government Channel on YouTube, um, we have someone who is really getting that started going. So most of the things you'll find on there right now are mine <laughs> that I, uh, <laughs> that I, um, you know, my classes. So what I'd really think would be great for you to watch on that is I have 20 things newcomers need to know about their central Florida landscape. There's part one and part two. I think that would be a great extra additional resource for you guys who are the part-time residents here. I have to thank the Indian River County Extension Office because I did watch their program and got you know a lot of ideas from them. Also have to thank Frank uh, Galdo in Pasco County for helping me, you know, a lot of people contributed to this particular uh, presentation today. Also a real life snowbird <laughs> from Port St. Lucy helped me. Her name is Lorraine and um, she happens to be my sister, but she also helped a lot with a lot of these ideas here. And of course, thank you to Karen 
for joining us for mosquito control. Speaking of that Indian River County Extension Office, they're going to be offering a two part series again snowbird gardening one and two. Um, so if you email me, this will be on your PDF where you can find the links to those classes. I think they're evening classes and it will expand upon what you've learned here. Maybe even learn some more. Yes, uh, November 16th and 30th. And I watched it and I found it very informative. And also, uh, let me tell you, uh, the urban horticulture agent there, Nikki Monroe, doesn't matter what she's saying, she's fascinating to listen to. She's very fun and I think you would really, really enjoy it. Plus also very knowledgeable. Okay. Let me see if I can stop sharing for now and see the chat. If we have any questions. Um, it, the question is, do you encourage sand or is mulch better? Sand is just going to be fantastic for our weeds to grow on. <laughs> um, our weeds are very, very used to growing on sand. So whereas weeds can grow on mulch as well. Um, it's, you know, for a while it's going to smother it out. You may have to then refresh the mulch again. Um, but, and it also helps um, bring some of that uh, good material to make our sand uh, to improve its nutrient and its water holding capacity. Um, Karen, do you mind adding your phone number to the chat before we go? Sure. Again. Uh it on there. There we go. Oh, you're welcome, um, Omar. And here is uh, Hernando County Mosquito Control 352-540-6552. And again, email me. I'll put that on here one more time. Lily B at hernandocounty.us. There I am. Um, if you'd like a PDF of this class or have any kind of questions at all. I think that wraps us up for today. Yes, let me turn off the recording. Thank you, everybody.